This is Glass City Humanist, a show about humanism, humanist values, by a humanist. Here is your host, Douglas Berger. We learn about the recent Ohio law that forces colleges and universities to do what many already do, make accommodations for religious believers. A push for safe housing in Maumee gets a push back from landlords not wanting to spend the money to comply. And March 1st brings an end to the pandemic allotment of food stamps. People shouldn't have to worry about paying for food. Glass City Humanist is an outreach project of the Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie, building community through compassion and reason for a better tomorrow. Being that this is January, uh, here in Ohio, we had just started a new legislative session uh, in, the le- in the Ohio legislature. Uh, it's mainly pretty much is uh, dominated by conservatives, um, dominated by a lot of Christian uh, nationalists. So they come up with uh, laws against abortion all the time and, and laws attacking trans people. And, um, trying now, one of the things that they want to do is they want to make it harder to, to, uh, change the Ohio Constitution because they know that there's a couple of groups that want to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot soon in order to protect abortion rights in Ohio since the Dobbs decision in the last, uh, last year, last uh, Supreme Court term, allowed the states to decide, wrongly of course, they wrongly decided to let the states decide whether or not abortion was against the law or not. And so that's one thing that the Christian nationalists want to do. Uh, They also tried to install their own uh, speaker of the Ohio House, Derek Marin, who is a representative from our neck of the woods in Monclova Township and um, that was not successful because the more m- semi-moderate Republicans worked with the Democrats and chose a different guy. But um, one of the things that they did in what they call the lame duck session, that's the end of the old, the old legislature before the new one starts, is they try to pass a bunch of bills that have been stalled out or sitting on the table. And one of those bills was House Bill uh, 353. And that was the title of it is, and, and I was reading a um, newspaper article and it had a list of bills that Governor DeWine had on his desk to sign or veto. And he also has a line item veto that he can veto only certain parts of bills, et cetera. And one of them was this House Bill 353. I'd never heard of it. Uh, the title gave me a pause. It was called uh, the Testing Your Faith Act. And it was sponsored by uh, Representative Gary Glick of District 88 over by Fremont. He is an ordained minister. So I knew this could not be good for for religious freedom. And technically, I was correct. Um, basically, what this, this bill, and it was signed by the governor, unfortunately, Testing Your Faith, would require each state institution of higher education to adopt a policy providing students with religious accommodations. And what that meant was that, let's say you're going to Ohio State University or University, well, in our neck of the woods, University of Toledo, and you're taking this class and you have a high holy day on an uh, on an exam day, because you know when the exam's going to be. Because in in colleges and universities, they have their syllabus and they have their class mapped out day by day, and they and you know when the exams are going to be. You know when the labs, if you if you have to do a lab, you know when those are going to be. So you you get the syllabus for this class. And you see that there's going to be an exam on, on one of your high holy days, whatever holy day that is. I don't know, Purim or, 
celebrating the moon or whatever that high holy day your religion follows. So basically what it would, what this law, uh, under, uh, House Bill 353 would do is require colleges and universities to have a policy where you know when your high holy days are and they would give you up to three, uh, days that you could take off. And be excused from class. And if there's a test on that day, then the professor or instructor would have to make an accommodation for you to take that test at another time or turn in your assignment, your project, or whatever it is. And so you would have three, during the course of this class time, you would have three of these days, but you would have to... uh preferably probably have a form to fill out and you would have to tell the instructor or professor ahead of time which days you needed not to be there for these high holy days and and so people are saying but doug that sounds like reasonable accommodation right well yeah because pretty much public colleges already do this you know if if you're taking a class and let's say your uncle dies and you're going to the funeral, they'll make an accommodation. Most instructors will. Most colleges will make accommodations for you if something comes up. If there's something in your life that comes up and you need to take off or you need to take an exam another day, they accommodate you. It's And I looked. The University of Toledo has a policy where like funerals or jury duty or military service or all these other kinds of stuff, religious holidays, you could take off, you know. You have to give some notice. It, it, it can't be used as an excuse. Like, why didn't you turn your project in, Doug? Well, because I was celebrating Darwin Day. Well, you, you can't do that. So, you know, I'm reading the text to this Testing Your Faith Act, and it's pretty, pretty uh, detailed that it is for people who have religious beliefs. It is not tailored for secular people. It's not telling, <laughs> it, you know, it's not for uh, people of conscience. It's not for secular people. You know, let's say, let's say I want to uh, celebrate uh, the flying spaghetti monster. And I know this is going to be on September the 18th and I have a, an exam that day. And so on the first day of class, I say, Professor, I want to take the 18th off for Flying Spaghetti Monster Day. This act will not protect you for that. And that's why, that's why I think this is a bad law. It's not needed. And it's, once again, it's low hanging fruit for Christian nationalists and religious, religious freedom fanatics that get it wrong, get religious freedom wrong and think that it should be used to get things over on people. And so, what I did was, uh, Gary Glick, he was a primary sponsor. There was a Democrat, Jessica Miranda, District 28, which I think is down by Cincinnati somewhere. She co-sponsored it, or, or was one of the primary sponsors. And then there was dozens of co-sponsors, like they get all these people signing on to it, and then they can use it in their, their campaign literature. Hey, I supported this bill. And so there was quite a few people on here, like, uh, the, uh, the, the usual suspects like Jennifer Gross, Sarah Fowler, author, who is a Christian nationalist, and, and Gene Schmidt, um, uh, Casey Weinstein, uh, J uh, happens to be Jewish. And then in the Senate, on the Senate side, uh, Paula Hicks Hudson from our area and Teresa Gavarone. And so what I did was I was curious and I wrote an email to Gary Glick and Representative Miranda and to Paula Hicks Hudson asking them the same question. And the question that I asked was that, you know, I saw that they co-sponsored House Bill 353, Ohio's Testing Your Faith Act, which directs higher ed institutions to develop, develop accommodations for students who need to be absent for religious reasons and was curious to know if you believe the act would cover accommodations for atheists or agnostics, could a student who wanted to be absent on Charles Darwin's birthday be able to have any assignments or tests moved to another date? 
just a simple question. And I actually didn't expect to hear back from the person that I'd heard back from. Curiously, I did not hear back from Representative Miranda, and I didn't hear from Senator Paula Hicks Hudson. I heard back from Representative Glick. And I wanted to read some of what he wrote back. Uh, his uh, legislative assistant, his legislative aide, uh, Ben Nettles, uh, sent me the email with Representative Glick's um, comments. Uh, he starts out, he says, thank you for the question. The first thing I will note is that it is not in my power to adjudicate the consequences of this bill. The implementation will be done by the institutions of higher learning, and the courts may decide any controversy. I can only speak to intent. While we recognize the right of everyone to believe, not to believe, or to question, the intent of the bill is not merely to celebrate and enjoy a day off, but to protect the conscience of students. Religious students may believe that a higher power requires them to observe certain days. Thus, many have been required to choose between obeying God or man which is technically not true. The question for those who would judge the applicability of this law to atheists and agnostics may be whether or not the conscience an atheist or agnostic requires them to observe certain days. The absence of a higher power imposing such rituals may be prob problematic. While Darwin may be a hero to some, he is not viewed as a deity. Celebrating his birthday would be no different than Washington, Lincoln, or Martin Luther King. While there may be value in those celebrations, there are not ritual requirements. It would have been interesting to have you present during our hearings to provide interested party testimony of how this may or may not impact your association. I would have welcomed your input in private conversations as well. Personally, I am an advocate for religious liberty for everyone, including atheists and agnostics. As a Christian, this bill will honestly have less of an effect on my community than it will have on Jews, Muslims, and others. But the liberty that I contend for is for everyone. Okay. And as I said, um, says, thus many have been required to choose between obeying God or man. That technically is not true. Um, there, there's been from time to time, you know, and th th again, this is, policy set by the school, uh, instructors and professors have some kind, some autonomy, but if you have a bad run in with a professor or instructor, you can get satisfaction from the administration. And most public colleges and universities are very inclusive of people of different religious values. That's what, you know, that's one of the things that they stress to do. So I don't think that religious people being forced to choose between God or man is actually a problem. I have not heard, and usually these kinds of things get uh, published in newspapers and, and on TV quite often when, if, if it does happen. The other thing that I disagree with in his response is his view of my beliefs, okay, it says, the absence of a higher power opposing such rituals may be problematic. While Darwin may be a hero to some, he is not viewed as a deity. Celebrating his birthday would be no different than Washington, Lincoln, or Martin Luther King. While there may be value in those celebrations, there are not ritual requirements. But celebrating Washington, Lincoln, or Martin Luther King, people get a day off. Uh, they don't schedule tests on those days. President's Day, some universities, they sell a, you know, they shut down or, or, or have a day off that day. Some do. Uh, Martin Luther King's birthday, we just got done celebrating and schools were out. So, you know, <laughs> the thing is that just because you believe in a higher power doesn't mean that you aren't going to get accommodations. You know, they do accommodations for all kinds of things. You know, just as long as you're not abusing it. Like this bill, this law, as it is written, says that you have to uh, submit the days off you want at the beginning of the semester or whenever the classes start. 
So again, you can't use it as an excuse for not doing the work. So it can't be abused. And when I saw a um, television report about this on my local TV, they talked to representatives of the University of Toledo and Bowling Green, and both of them have similar policies. So they're not going to change a thing. So this is just a performa, what I call a performa, uh, uh, masturbation, as it were, of uh, virtual signaling to conservatives. So this is just like any other, <laughs> any other of these, these, uh, cultural war, uh, uh, laws that are trying to address a, an issue that doesn't exist. And reading in the record of the committee meetings, I looked at the, the, they had a, a lot of proponent testimony. They had, I don't think I saw one opposition testimony written or otherwise and they were all from muslims and jewish groups which tend to get discriminated against sometimes by certain uh instructors and professors especially muslims uh, a lot of a lot of people still have issues with muslims as you know they shouldn't be but you know so but i also saw a lot of pro pro uh, proponent uh, testimony from a group that is going around the country and getting laws similar to this passed in all the states. So, unfortunately, Representative Glick makes it sound like he's solving a problem that actually exists when instead he is responding to a uh, religious conservative uh, lobby group that is getting laws like this passed around the country for no other reason than to get it passed. And trying, and trying to get special privileges for religious people. The thing about it is, you know, if you're going, if, if you're paying money to go to a college and you know that they're going to have class or a test on your holy days, that's a choice that you make. You know, you shouldn't get special treatment because you're religious. Because it's not like they're springing it on you all of a sudden. Again, a lot of these, a lot of these classes, these college classes, you know ahead of time what the dates are. And this is, this is the choice that you make that you're going to take this class or you're going to go to this school. If you want a, a college or university to conform to your religious beliefs and philosophies and rituals, then you need to choose a college or university that is catered to your religious beliefs. So if you're a Catholic and you want to have Mother Teresa's day off, then you need to go to Catholic University or Notre Dame or one of these places where they shut down for Mother Teresa's birthday or whatever, whatever saint or, or bishop that they're celebrating. But if you go to a public college or university, you can ask for accommodations. And in most cases, you're going to get it. You're not being discriminated against if you don't. And if it's that much of a problem, then you have to reassess yourself whether or not you are going to attend that college or university. You know, that's all up to you. For college and university, you don't have to attend that college or university. That's a choice that the individual makes. And when you make choices, sometimes you have to compromise your values. Sometimes. And you just have to decide for yourself if that compromise is enough. Or, you know, if you want to make that compromise or, or, or you don't. But you shouldn't have to have the state pass a law to allow somebody to make an accommodation for you just so you don't have to make that choice because you're allowing the state to make that choice for you. And I know a lot of these uh, conservative Christian nationalists don't want the state making your, making your religious choices. For more information about the topics in this episode, including links used, please visit the episode page at glasscityhumanist.show. As we move uh, further 
out of the pandemic time of uh, 2020 to 2022, uh, one of the things, one of the problems with uh, economics and, and society in general is affordable housing. We've had, we've seen a lot of rental, uh, increases in rent. Uh, we, uh, had during the pandemic, there was a moratorium on evictions and that's gone away. And a lot of landlords are now, uh, evicting their tenants. Um, there's been a lot of speculation on, uh, uh apartment housing. So much so that, that quite a few places have been bought up by, uh, either not local owners or out of state owners. And then they let the complex go. They don't uh, maintain it or anything like that. And so there's just this been this, and it's been a problem for quite a while, even before the pandemic, affordable housing. Uh, where I'm from, my hometown, they had new, new reports, luxury apartment complex here. Uh, luxury com- condominiums b- being built on the east side and et cetera, et cetera. But we had a problem with, with affordable housing. Uh, my sister was developmentally disabled, but she wanted to live on her own. She was functional. You know, it wasn't like she needed somebody to help her to live or anything like that. She was functional. She was just developmentally disabled. And so we looked into getting her housing for in the local housing authority, in the go- local government housing authority. And back in the day, we called it Section 8, where you would go and find a place that was, that was, would, had market rent and they would accept this voucher. So you only paid a percentage of your income and not the full market rate. Well, a lot of that housing stock doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. There's just been a lot of problems. So we tried to get my sister into uh, government housing. And there was like a, a waiting list, a three year waiting list. And this was, this was in the late eighties. There was a three year uh, waiting list in my hometown, um, South of Toledo still has a problem with affordable housing. They had a lot of housing stock uh, that low income people lived in that was near the river. They got wiped out during the flood in 2007 and, and not rebuilt because you couldn't rebuild in a floodplain. But, and so I always look for when they, when they announce new housing that there's going to be affordable housing. Um, there was a senior living, uh, senior, uh, age, uh, housing complex that was built on the south end of Finlay. And it was required to have, because it received government assistance in building the building that they had to have a certain percentage of the units that would be affordable and the rest of them would be market rates. And so the market rate at that time was six, $700 a month. And the affordable ones were 400, 450, not too much different, but affordable. Well, this particular senior complex on the South end of Finley they had three units that were affordable out of probably a hundred units, only three. So it, that's just ridiculous. You know, if you're talking about a percentage, if you have a hundred units and you want a good percentage, it should be, it should match at least the poverty level of the area that you build in. And so if it's 10, 15% poverty rate in, in your, that community, then you should have 10 to 15% of your units should be affordable. And so, you know, housing, affordable housing is something that, that I feel is important. As a humanist, it's important to have, for people to have affordable, safe, affordable housing. So the other day I was reading the Toledo Blade and they had a story about, uh, some housing, uh, zoning for, for apartment housing that they're, going to want to revise in the city of Maumee, which is a suburb south of Toledo. Maumee rental registration proposal draws residents to council. They had a large number of people who, <laughs> and it, and it, and I'll tell you why this is odd. Um, 
in the TV coverage of this meeting, they call these landlords housing providers, air quotes, housing providers. No, they're landlords, okay? They're just trying to put slap lipstick on a pig. Trust me. Um, most, most landlords, I, I, I have a feeling are pretty good, but usually the ones that complain about regulations are the ones that need the regulations. From my past experience, my vast experience of renting from people, <laughs> I know that somebody who complains about having to spend money on their, on their apartments for regulation purposes, they are the ones that need the regulations. <laughs> and so what they were going to do was um, they were going to start a rental registration, city rental registration, and, which means any existing rental properties need to be put on a list or they will be in violation. A rigorous inspection system will also be imposed every two years with hourly fees for the inspectors to be charged to the rental owners. An application system for owners would also be put in place in addition to source of income rules and a requirement that property owners residing more than 75 miles out of town hire a local agent. The the reasoning, you know, and, and, and you can see the city of Maumee, they, they're concerned about affordable housing, not only affordable housing, but they're concerned about absentee landlords. That's a big problem. Big problem in the city of Toledo, big problem everywhere. And again, these are these housing speculators, because you see the sign sometimes that says we buy houses and things like that. This is a housing speculation. So you have like these investment groups that get together, they go into an area and they buy up all the housing stock. And it's investment. So they want to pull as much money out of it as they can to get a return on their investment. They don't want to spend money on it. All right. So they just do the bare minimum just to, to make it kind of safe, but it's not. <laughs> and if it's inspected, they would probably condemn some property sometimes because they let them go so bad. And then when a city, um, gets a complaint about uh, some housing and they go to contact the owner, they can't get a hold of the owner because he lives out of town, uh, or, or the investment group is in a different country or something like that. And so they're, they're, they have a hard time making somebody accountable. And so there was a lot of these, quote, housing providers, unquote, that were very upset with the actual idea of having a list, a rental list, and having inspections every two years. Which is funny, because I did not know that having, <laughs> having uh, safe, affordable housing was such a burden to the property owners. You know, and my thinking is, is if you can't bother to make even basic maintenance fixes on your, on your rental properties, because you think that your tenants are going to ruin it. Cause a lot of these people were talking about that, that their tenants just trash the place. If, if that's your reasoning, then you are in the wrong business. You need to sell your properties and go, and, and go do something else. So it's like, why are you providing, you know, housing for somebody for $400 a month if you don't even give them the basic, uh, uh appreciate their basic, uh, worth and dignity as a human being? You know, you just, you just see them as a burden. You know, that's just ridiculous. I can't, I can't fathom somebody like that. You know, I've been pretty lucky in the last few years of having a landlord who actually cares about me, <laughs> you know, and, and he personally comes to the property to fix things and he's always asking, how's it going? And, you know, sometimes he gets a little no nosy, but, you know, I see that his heart's in the right place. And so I just wish that everybody could have it, have that. So, like, for example, in this uh, Toledo Blade article about this ordinance, the discussion about this ordinance. And, and, oh, and the other part of the ordinance was that these rental properties had to meet current building codes, which just doesn't seem like that seems like a, should be debated or should be said. 
You know, you're providing a property to someone to rent and you want it to be as safe as possible and you, you should ab abide by the current building codes. And so the, the this one housing provider, um, Mr. Temple, he said, there's a house on Wayne Street that was built in 1898. This is not a house with a lot of insulation. This is probably a house with knob and tube wiring. It's got all kinds of issues in terms of its age, but it is a well-kept house. It has running water, it has heat, and it is habitable. Mr. Temple said that according to the regulations in the current ordinance, he thinks an inspector could come in and order a house of, of the age, in his example, to put in a lot more insulation. This would require a huge step of tearing out the walls and redoing the wiring. You're talking about a very costly upgrade. Eh, not really. <laughs> you know, there, there's ways of retrofitting older houses for, for insulation. And, and, you know, and if your, your house is not, your building that you're providing to renters is not well insulated, you're costing the renter in utilities. So it's costing them more to live there than it should. All because you wanted to save a buck with this old house. I, I, I commend, I commend mommy for doing it. Of course, the other, the other side of it is too that Mayor Carr believes that having stricter regulation would keep the blight, which would keep the crime, which means keep poor people out. And so that, that's a whole other story that I'm probably more doing more speculating than I should be on that. But again, I think affordable housing is important and I commend mommy for at least trying to get that done. Do you like what you hear? Would you like to support the show so we can make it better? You can write a review for podcast apps that allow reviews. You can share our website, glasscityhumanist.show, with your friends, and you can donate to the show using the donate link on the website. Any support is appreciated. Since we were talking about the pandemic earlier, when we were talking about housing, I wanted to make mention for people out there that the pandemic emergency food stamp program is going to be ending um, at the end of February. And what that means is that during the, during the pandemic, they had instituted an emergency um, payout that took place each month, which w was the maximum amount, maximum allotment, uh, allowed by law for people that were on, uh, SNAP or food stamps, as we call it in the, called it in the old days. And so it was meant to help people who may have lost their jobs because of the pandemic or, or got sick and couldn't work and had no income because SNAP generally is a, it's not supposed to pay for all your food. It's supposed to be a supplement. That's why they call it a supplement nutrition. I disagree. I think it should pay for everybody's food that are, that's needing, you know, that are low income or disabled. It, the government should pay for all your food. But th so they had this program during the pandemic that people that received SNAP got the full allotment. Now, what this means is I know an older individual who was in their, in their seventies on social security. Um, she was before the pandemic, she was getting, uh, $20 a month. And, uh, that was because she was getting social security. <laughs> and her Medicare. And so she was getting $20 a month to spend on food. Now we know we've been through this inflation and, and the, the uh, supply chain problems and, and, you know, eggs are $5 a dozen now in some stores higher in some places, $20 not going to go that far. $20 didn't go far before the pandemic, <laughs> to, to be honest with you. 
I mean, you, you take $20 and just take $20. Next time you go to the store, just take $20 and just try to get food for your family just on $20. Now, again, people are saying, but Doug, it's supplemental. So you need to pay for some of it out of your own pocket. That's true. But $20, it, it's, it's almost not worth it. Okay. Now, now she was a, a fan, her family unit was just her. So that's why it was $20. Now, a family of four, I think they get their standard allotment is probably more than that, probably a hundred bucks or whatever. But during the pandemic, this older person that I knew was getting $232 a month. In addition to the $20 that she got as her regular allotment. And so she did not want for food for the entire pandemic. Uh, she was able to buy, uh, at the meat market, they had freezer boxes. So they had like, uh, collections of meats in a freezer box and she brought it home, put it in her freezer. So she had meat all month. Um, and fresh meat all month and it didn't go spoil because it was frozen, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and, and poor, uh, not steak, but, uh, pork steak and pork chops, you know, basic stuff. So she was able to get that that she normally wouldn't get, you know, cause these freezer boxes were like a hundred bucks, 120 bucks. All right. She was also didn't have to worry about, uh, pinching pennies, getting her other food. You know, if she wanted, if she needed sugar, she got sugar. If she needed uh, brown sugar, she got brown sugar. If she needed eggs, she bought eggs. And she didn't have to worry about it. You know, and I know I was reading an article that some families, depending on, you know, what their assessment was, they were probably getting, you know, five to six hundred to eight hundred dollars a month for, you know, family of four or five people. That go, you can make that go a long way. And, and that's how it should be. You know, food security is, is, is an issue. It's a, it's a problem. And now it's going to get worse because these, these emergency allotments are ending. And just like what we saw when the free lunches, the free meals at schools ended, you know, cause they were, the USDA was providing money for free lunches for all students in all the public schools. You know, not just little Timmy who's low income. You know, they, they were doing everybody. And that's how it should be. And, and the same with the, with the uh, food stamps. People shouldn't have, people that, that are wanting for money, either their disability or social security, or, or whatever, they shouldn't have to spend their money, their income, their little income on food. You know, that's just too much. You know, cause you had to rents, the rents went up, uh, other things went up in the, when the inflation went up. And so did the food prices, you know? So yeah, you're getting two, three, four hundred, eight hundred dollars a month. But you're spending a lot more on your, on food. So that program is ending at the end of February. So if you know some people, if you have some friends or family that are on SNAP and, and you know that they've been getting these larger allotments, uh, you might want to check, check on them in March and make sure that, you know, they're finding the resource. Cause I know, I know even, even with those allotments that, that, uh, there was, there's strain on the, uh, charity network of food, food banks and things, uh, because, you know, people that didn't qualify for SNAP still needed food when they weren't working. And so a lot of, a lot of these, uh, food banks have had, had rough times too. So that's something to keep in mind. Like I said, you know, I think that, that kids at school, should get free lunches, free breakfast. They shouldn't have to pay anything for milk or food. So we don't have any of these, these stories about, uh, kids getting bologna and cheese because their parents didn't put more money on their account. And then, you know, grandma and grandpa shouldn't have to spend, you know, 30% of their income on food. We as a country 
we can do that. We can make that happen. And it, and it's not, <laughs> and it's not about whether or not they deserve it because they're human. They deserve to have food, safe food, safe, fresh, reliable food that's cost effective for them. Everybody that, that, <laughs> You know, I don't know how much of a, more of a natural right that is than, than it should, it should be. There shouldn't be anybody that goes hungry. There shouldn't be anybody that has awful food to eat. Uh, there shouldn't be anybody that has to make a decision between cat, you know, cat food or, or food or, or make a choice between their medicine and food. That's just uh, uh, implausible. And it, and we saw during the pandemic, that we can do it and the economy doesn't collapse. You know, that was the argument from conservatives, from cheap labor conservatives, uh, whenever we tried to increase the money that was going out for, for so the social network, the social na- safety net, that it would collapse the economy. It's like, no, it hasn't. Just like, just like pausing payments on student loans didn't collapse the economy. So we can cancel student loans. It's not going to hurt us. So that's what I wanted to say about that, uh, about the, the food stamp program. And then as a, as a last note for, uh, people, friends and members of the secular humanists of Western Lake Erie, um, got an email this past week from Amazon and, and I'm sure there's probably people out there that also got the email. Uh, they had this program called a- Amazon Smiles and our group signed up for it and basically People could choose our charity, our group, Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie. When they would purchase things, we would get a percentage of those sales. Um, it wasn't very much, uh, five, 15 bucks, I think at the most, 20 bucks at the most. And that was a quarter, you know, every three months or so. But it was nice to get those donations. Well, got an email last week that, uh, or this, this week actually, as I'm taping this that uh, Amazon is ending the Amazon Smiles program. So, and for some people in my group, that was a good thing because they don't like Amazon. <laughs> so, so there's the, the, the thing, the, you know, the sidestep. But, you know, they gave the old thing, well, you know, we're going to use our resources more effectively and helping more people. That's just BS, really. They just trying to save some money. And they probably decided that this program was costing them more money than it, than it was generating in sales. So they cut it. You know, a lot of these charity things that these big corporations do is for advertising. You know, yeah, they're helping people, but it's also for advertising. They wouldn't do it unless they got notoriety for it, unless it brought in customers. They wouldn't do it. That's why, you know, when you go to like some festivals or fairs and you, you see these card, well, at least in our area, we have cardboard waste cans and it has Kroger grocery stores written on it. Well, Gro- Kroger's donated this. Well, they donated it because it says Kroger on it. <laughs> they would, they wouldn't donate it if there was no, no logo on it. They wouldn't donate it. And many, and we've also found in my group in particular, when we were, checking, uh, when we were working on the, uh, uh, Lucas County Children's Services holiday gift thing that some of these companies won't donate products anymore. They'll donate money or they'll donate services like Best Buy used to donate TVs and, and stereos and things like that. And they don't do that anymore. They, 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 um, donate like, uh, repair services or the geek squad or, or things like that. And, that's because it doesn't cost them anything to do so. <laughs> it doesn't cost them anything. And, and, but it's still part of their advertising campaign, their marketing campaign. But anyway, so I just want to let people know that that animal Amazon smiles, uh, program is ending. Uh, we have, we are still part of the Kroger cares. Um, when, if you use Kroger, if you shop at Kroger's and you have chosen us as your charity, uh, we get a percentage of those sales back. And that's been actually quite lucrative for us. Uh, we were getting in the, uh, per quarter, probably about $30 every three months. 
we have four, seven families that participate right now. And uh, if you want to know how to do that, you can check our website under our donation page and we tell you how to, how to uh, ch- pick us for the charity. And we also have a donation page. So if you just want to donate directly to us without having to go through any of these affiliate programs, we're more than happy to accept your donation. Thank you for listening. For more information about the topics in this episode, please visit the episode page at glasscityhumanist.show. Glass City Humanist is an outreach of the Secular Humanists of Western Lake Erie. Sholey can be reached at humanistswle.org. Glass City Humanist is hosted, written, and produced by Douglas Berger, and he's solely responsible for the content. Our theme music is Glass City Jam, composed using the Amplify Studio. See you next time. Thank you.